Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Faces of FinOps, powered by ProsperOps. I'm your host, John Meyer. Faces of FinOps podcast is about highlighting thought leaders in the cloud financial management space and insights on how they're making an impact not only within their organization, but in the broader FinOps community. Today's guest is Dieter Mason, a senior cloud governance engineer at Roku, and also he's a FinOps ambassador. Dieter is a member of Roku's cloud technology and infrastructure team and supporting cloud finance across AWS, GCP, and Azure. Please join me in welcoming Dieter to the show. Dieter, thanks for joining me. Hey, everyone. So, Dieter, I'm going to kick things off. How about you tell us about yourself and where you're from? Um, I'm originally from Germany. Um, I came on internship to the United States and then got married and uh, decided to stay. Uh, you came on an internship. What were you doing for the internship? You know, um, at university, uh, when I graduated, um, one of my professors told me that out of all students over the past five years, I graduated with the highest score in databases. It was a surprise to me, but the professor um, suggested I should be using that for my career, right? So uh, early in my career, I started building databases. Let's actually kick things off a little bit more and talk about your career and your journey to FinOps. Yeah, of course. So when I, you know, eventually database, every company needs at least one database, you know? So um, what happens is that once the database is built, um, I need to tune it, right? Um, once it's productionalized and it, the transactions per seconds are going up, right? Um, it becomes more of a tuning effort. So what I ended up doing is I ended up specializing in, in tuning databases. And at some point, um, I joined PayPal. PayPal at that time, 2006, had the um, highest transaction database on the planet, Oracle database, um, 50,000 transactions per second, running on a Sun uh, E15,000. So that was, a, that was a big database, right? However, at, at PayPal, I also had the opportunity to then, I stayed there for seven years, right? I had the opportunity to switch uh, and manage the network operation center. Uh, where I learned all of uh, the operations of the different systems and subsystems, which was very interesting and exciting to me, and a step to get out of the database area. So from PayPal, what were you doing next? Well, you know, I sent a resume um, to Google. Uh, I was thinking, what what's the worst that can happen, right? They, they reject me, and then I'm n no worse off, really. However, Google actually came back and said, hey, we are looking for someone that understands a complex environment with different systems and subsystems and can identify inefficiencies and carve these out so that we can move it to the public cloud offering. Uh, Google's public cloud back then in 2013 was growing faster uh, than they could build data centers. Building a data center is usually like a two-year affair. Um, and you know, while they had multiple sites that they were building, there, the demand for Google's public cloud was um, so strong that they they needed to um, find a stopgap measure um, to use internal resources and assign it to public cloud. Dieter, I'm noticing a trend. Now you went from databases, now you're trying to understand complex environments and Google Cloud. What was after Google? Well, as I was working at Google, right, and, and doing great things, I noticed that um, I'm only familiar with Google technologies. And so um, I sort of became unemployable outside of Google, right? Um, no, no one has Google, only Google has Google, right? So I was actually really happy when Netflix reached out to me and said, hey, um, that was in 2015, we are spending $250 million annually on, on Amazon Web Services. And um, the we don't believe we need all of this, right? We need someone like you that can find these inefficiencies um, and uh, tell us where we can save money. So Dieter, you went from mm -hmm. understanding databases to Google Cloud to understanding complex environments and broadening your knowledge around FinOps and you know trying to reduce the expenditure within environments. And that's where you went to Netflix, uh, dealt with AWS, What's your next role? What are you currently doing now? Well, there was one step in between. Um, at Netflix, when I if, I if I found something, it didn't matter if it was a small dollar amount or a large dollar amount, 
Sometimes uh, the engineers acted on it, sometimes they didn't. It was really independent of, of the dollar size. So that was a little bit, um, you know, not satisfying for me, right? Um, that I do work and, and the work is not being acted upon. So um, I was thinking there should be a better way of, of managing that, like a organization-wide program um, where I then would go into the different business units and uh, find optimization opportunities there. Um, and I looked around and by accident, I found a job posting from Intuit. And Intuit, uh, the, the job posting was exactly what I just described, right? Word for word. Um, the hiring manager actually asked me, why did you pick us? And I explained to them that your job posting was word for word what I envisioned, right? So at Intuit, for four years, I was running the, back then we called it Cloud Financial Management Program, uh, starting 2016, right? The, the very first thing that uh, people were saying is um, they expected that there was a lot of waste, right? Um, back then, Flexera came, came out with the 30% um, of waste across all of cloud resources, right? So I started working on that. I built a system where we had um, waste sensors. A waste sensor is just a small little script that finds something and puts it into a database, right? Then we uh, built a dashboard on top of that data that showed waste by um, engineering leader uh, sorted by the highest dollar amount on top, right? And with six waste sensors, um, we found about 28% waste. Um, th that was the start, right? Over the four years, we were able to improve that. We increased the amount of waste sensors. So we sort of raised the bar a little bit, right? Um, from, from six to 32, something like that. And we were able to push waste down from 28% to 5%. So that was, that was wow. really great. So you took your knowledge from the database, you know, starting out, and then you ultimately applied that to your, I want to say, cloud financial management or your FinOps. Was FinOps actually utilized then? Was it an actual culture established or is it something that you guys were underneath the cloud financial management and eventually identified as, you know, a FinOps practice? Yeah, so FinOps didn't exist back in 2016. I actually met J.R. Stormont at reInvent that year. And he asked me, uh, Dieter, do you think this cloud financial management thing has legs? Is that a thing, right? And I told him, you know, from my experience, um, as long as engineers are working, there will be waste, right? This is analogous to a industrial kitchen where you have multiple cooks, right? You need to clean every day uh, because the place will get messy. So, um, you know, and, and I think that impressed JR uh, quite a bit. And back then he was working for Cloudability that was uh, later acquired by Aptio. And I think he was the, the um, at Cloudability, he was the CTO, maybe even the CEO. And at Aptio, he was the CTO for, I think a couple of weeks. And then they let him go, right? And uh, in 2019, he founded the FinOps Foundation. And so FinOps is the, the first time then where this FinOps term was, was actually coined. So Dieter, what are you doing now though? So, um, you know, at Intuit, what, uh, what I was doing is I, I did that waste management, right? And then there's something called convertible RIs. And so every week we would look at what is unused and we would use the convertible RIs to convert it to something that will be used in the next week, right? And that was sort of like an ongoing basis. But I also uh, noticed that um, the forecasting of cloud spend was a huge effort. Uh, something around 30 people were working on that for the better part of three months, right? And their, um, the, the forecast variance at best was 15%, and at worst, it was um, 70%. Right, which is unusable. So I was thinking, you know, back then machine learning was a was a thing, and um, I I installed a machine learning system on my laptop, right? Connected my laptop to the cost and usage report uh, from AWS, and I, um, I I ran the default machine learning model that that came with the free software package, right? It was called a bag of neural networks. And uh, it was able to do uh, a forecast with an uh, average variance between 6 and 9%. So I went to leadership and I explained to them that, look, I did this on my laptop, right? Um, we, we can do something similar here for, for the forecast. 
um, 30 people over three months is a little bit excessive um, every year, right? Maybe there is something that we can do uh, better. Now, while leadership um, was conscious about that, you know, software can possibly solve their forecasting problems, they didn't want to use what I had on my laptop, right? That was sort of not like an enterprise solution for them, right? Um, so I was, you know, a little bit frustrated and a former PayPal coworker um, came to me. I was like posting on LinkedIn and those kind of things, right? And the, the person said like, hey, Roku is actually looking to build a cloud forecasting system. So um, I joined uh, Roku during uh, the pandemic in 2020 um, and started building uh, a forecasting system that has a 2% uh, forecast variance, which is um, fantastic, right? This is like an industry leading thing. And um, so I was, I was really happy about that. 2%. That's actually really cool. So you were the first FinOps hire at Roku? That's correct. Yes. And and the only one, we have a data scientist that helps me with, with reporting. But other than that, um, I'm the only FinOps person there. Well, let me ask you, as the first thing that you did when you joined Roku as the first FinOps hire, what were the number three things that you took on or wanted to achieve? Yeah. So I looked at waste um, first, right? Because that was my bread and butter at Intuit. Um, and Roku's waste is um, less than 1%. So I was actually stunned when I found out, right? Um, the, uh, the engineers are really disciplined. They are turning off their workloads over the weekends and things like that, right? So I, uh, there was nothing to do for me there, right? <laughs> I was like, I was done. Um, so while I was building the forecasting system, I also looked at, um, uh, but in uh, 2019, AWS actually introduced uh, savings plans, right? Um, and at Intuit, we converted all of our RIs to savings plans, which also means that I didn't have anything to do after that. Um, and, and the waste was already at 5%, right? So at, at Roku, one of the first things uh, then that I looked at is um, how, how do the savings plans look like? And they were non-existent. So I built like um, 80% uh, savings plan coverage, um, which you know, saves about 14% of the total cloud bill. Okay, you came in and they had less than 1% of waste. I feel like that's a job already completed in a task. I mean, that's a hell of a discipline for a company to have 1% less of waste. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was, frankly, I was stunned, right? Because I was, uh, I wanted to bring my, my waste dashboards, my waste sensors, set everything up, and then less than 1%, right? Um, so that I was a little bit disappointed, to be honest. But, you know, Nothing to do there. I can focus on other things. Dieter, how would you rank the company's maturity for FinOps? Are you in a crawl, a walk, a run using various maturity levels? You know, it really depends, right, on the different FinOps capabilities. Um, and it's not wrong if you are in a crawl capability, right? Let's say you are a small shop, you spent like 10 million annually on cloud. Um, and you do your forecasts in a spreadsheet. That's okay, right? Um, you don't need huge automation there. You don't need to um, be the most sophisticated system. Um, once every three or four years, right, you do a contract renegotiation with the cloud service provider, and um, you need to forecast of, you know, what the trajectory will look like four years into the future, right? Uh, if you do that with spreadsheets, that's completely fine. Roku itself, you know, in, in the various uh, FinOps capabilities, um, mostly we are run, right? Um, but I think it's also a culture. Um, for FinOps to really to work, the executives need to know that cloud, as, as long as you build things in the cloud, there will be waste, right? And they need to know that this waste cleanup, this, this FinOps um, discipline is something that needs to be done on an ongoing basis, right? You don't just do FinOps, uh, you know, once a quarter and then you do something else. It's a continuous thing, right? There is cost anomalies, um, all kinds of, you know, um, training and, um, you know, credits, um, bill inconsistencies, invoices, wrong, wrong number on the invoice, that kind of stuff, right? So it's an ongoing discipline. Um, I have been doing it for 10 years now. So I, you know, can do a lot of things in very little time. And that really helps me, you know, get through my workday.
When you say it's an ongoing thing, and I think here's the thing with the FinOps culture and that it should be known is that it's, and I like that you pointed out that it's not done like once a month or once every couple of months. It's something that should be done. Do you recommend obviously daily? You're looking at the reporting daily. You're looking at anomalies daily. You're looking at costs either up or down daily as, yeah. as part of it so you can be in, stay on top of things. That's absolutely right. Um, it's it's. I have a daily routine, right? I look at cost anomalies in the morning. Um, it, some of those are self-service, where the engineers actually get the the messages. Um, some we don't have the automation yet, and I just sent an email over with a screenshot, you know, of the of the cost graph. <laughs> it goes up, um, that kind of stuff, right? Then I look at the reservation management, the savings plans, and that RI portfolio um, improves gross margin by about 1.6%. So that is very substantial, right? If, if some random guy like me can help you save millions, why wouldn't you want to try that? Dieter, what are some of the common or biggest mistakes that you might see from an immature FinOps culture? You know, um, it is, I think the most profound thing is to not n know what FinOps is, right? And not know um, that it's something that is ongoing. Um, it, it's a continuous effort, right? And um, not have that leadership support because it trickles down, right? I do uh, monthly tech talks on specific technology subjects, right? For both AWS and GCP, um, where we train the engineers in new technologies, right? Um, large language models, those kind of uh, things, right? that, that are, are relatively new, but also older technologies where engineers may have made a mistake, right? For example, if you move billions of objects in AWS S3 from one storage tier to another storage tier, there is a transition fee. And, you know, it's, it's like three cents for a thousand objects, but if you have a billion, that can be tens of thousands of dollars, right? So we may need to do a um, deep dive into that technology and then explain that a little bit more. And these technologies are different between the cloud providers, right? So for example, if you do uh, go into GCP blob storage, um, retrieval is instantaneous. Um, you just have to pay a price for it. While on AWS, the, the, the rehydration takes time and the objects are being put into a staging area out of which they are being deleted 30 days later. So they, there is sufficient difference between those different technologies where um, you know the engineers might get confused and you need to provide training. But any training that I provide, if there is no leadership support, um, then I'm just spinning my wheels and, and I can't be effective. Leadership support is very key for any type of implementation, including FinOps. You've indicated that this is very, uh, like a requirement for an yeah. immature FinOps organization. Have you seen any best practices that you might recommend for a mature FinOps you know, environment or organization that you think should be implemented that might not be thought of? You know what uh, we did at Intuit um, that worked really well is to have sort of quarterly business reviews. Um, that are FinOps specific, right? And you get a um, CTO, CFO, um, someone like that, right? Depending on the size of the company, your CEO could be present as well, right? And you, it's sort of like a sprint review meeting, right? This is what we did in the past. This is what we are planning for the future. Uh, here's the current roadblocks that we are having, right? And you do sort of like this, this kind of business rhythm, right? You establish that business rhythm where, um, you know, the, the executives then not just get informed, but over time, they will actually reach out to you to get information to make better decisions. Dieter, you were talking about Intuit where you used machine learning. Are you using any type of AI or automation within Roku or suggestions that others could use for their FinOps practice? You know, AI now with, with ChatGPT, it's exploding, right? I have seen examples for where, you know, you have a video and something happens in a video. You know, let's say in uh, the video shows a supermarket, someone goes and, and drops a drink and someone else comes and slips on that, right? And you can then ask the large language model um, what happened. And they will say person A came in, you know, and spilled that drink and person B slipped on it and possibly injured himself. And, um, you know, emergency services should be contacted, <laughs> right? This, this, those are capabilities that 
that have not existed a year ago, right? And it can be used everywhere, right? Not just in, in FinOps, but there is multiple, multiple initiatives at Roku for, for different things, right? Think of the um, um, you know, video uh, recommendations, what you should watch next, right? Um, it, these, these types of technologies um, provide substantial, significant changes to what we were able to do in the past versus what we can now do with these new, new technologies. And are you using some of this type of automation to achieve or make the daily reporting within FinOps a little more uh, expedited or to provide the correct reporting? You know, uh, it is really funny. Um, you know, two years ago, data scientists were just playing with things, right? And it was sort of a novelty. Um, when I, fortunately at Roku, I have the ability if I, if I need some engineering work to get done, I can just open a JIRA ticket, right? Which is just a ticketing system. And then, you know, the work will eventually get done. It has to be assigned to a sprint and so forth, right? So I asked for a cost anomaly detection on GCP, right? They don't have a solution for that yet. AWS has a native solution. GCP is, is working on something, but we need this right now, right? So I asked and the, the engineer just naturally went and used a machine learning model for anomaly detection. I didn't even expect that, right? It is such a prolific technology now that um, th that was the first go-to. Um, I would have done something with like, you know, if it's 20% more than the median over the last 30 days or something, something simple, you know? No, they just slapped a machine learning model on that problem and it does a good job. And let's talk more about some of the things that you and your team are responsible for at Roku. You know, I do a lot of different things, right? Cost anomaly detection being one of them, um, uh, RI management, and, um, you know, they have an uh, RI automation uh, product. Um, but however, you know, there are some blind spots. So we um, have a weekly meeting where we go over those uh, and see what we can improve, right? And, and help also not just us, but also help the vendor improve their product. Then, uh, you know, anything that is contract negotiations, um, I take care of, of that end to end, right? I negotiate the contract with the vendor. Um, I get the contract through legal review. I work with legal on that. And then I also get it signed by leadership. Uh, so leadership needs to be briefed about that. Um, I even pay the invoices. I'm working in the uh, central technology and infrastructure team. And um, they, they have 12 vendors that um, need their invoices paid, right? So I, I, I take care of a lot of different things on a day-to-day -day basis. Dieter, what are some of the biggest challenges that you and the team are facing right now? You know, challenges, I, I think there's technology challenges, right? And there is also people challenges. Um, I think interactions with people are the, the most important, the, the most outcome driven and the most challenging, right? Because you don't know um, what is the knowledge uh, of that person, right? What, what is the skill level? Um, at what level do you need to explain something, right? So I, I typically start, you know, with the basics and, and work my way up. We have sometimes situations, you know, where I ask for something and the person comes back and says no. And I'm like, um, you know, that's not a sufficient uh, result here, right? You need to provide a little bit of context at, as to, you know, you, you probably talk to a team in the background and you uh, deliberated on, on this topic, right? So provide a little bit context around what constitutes that no, and maybe you should also come up with alternatives, right? Um, we, we have one or two alternatives that we, that we can do um, rather than just saying no, you know, and it's, it's uh, these types of people interactions, right? That that um, I think I'm still learning and I'm trying to get better at that um, because I think everything that you do um, is is done for people and and if the people support you, your life will be easier. And I'm happy happy to partner with them. Dear, I agree with you. What are your feelings on accurate reporting capabilities in order to make the most efficient decision with regards to performing an action within the organization? That's critical, right? Um, and uh, it also has to be timely, right? I see Roku has about 2,500 engineers, uh, 4,600 employees. Um, there's a lot of experimenting going on, right? 
and the the engineers need to know immediately um, what what is the cost impact of an experiment, right? Um, for example, at Intuit, we had a uh, a project where you can scan a receipt, and it will find the the total on the receipt, um, and then add it into QuickBooks, right? Um, not ev not every receipt looks the same. Um, some receipts, if you buy like raw materials like lumber or something like that, the, the structure on the receipt is a little bit different, right? So it's not a, a trivial problem to solve. But the the initial version was something like you know five thousand eight hundred dollars um, a day, and um, we were that was good for a proof of concept, right? But it is very expensive. So um, we, we were then later uh, able to tune the machine learning model that was used for that and uh, get it down to eighty dollars a day, which is m much more doable and much more financial financially feasible. You remember that the FinOps survey came out and the, a couple of years in a row. And in fact, this last year, there was a, some indicator of 30% of the effort is getting engineers to perform action. You have over 2000 plus engineers. Are you running into the same issue and how are you approaching it? It depends. It depends how you structure that, right? Um, if you have leadership support, um, it, it will be much easier, right? Um, because you, and, and it also is, depends how much training does leadership have, right? And, you know, how big is the engineering team as well, right? Like at Intuit, I had a situation where one of my um, leaders w wasn't really performing well. They, they were not responding in a timely manner. And when I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, it turns out it's just him and, and another engineer. So the team had two people, right? So be aware what what your target is, but the the culture is critical, right? Um, to have this FinOps culture and be able to just go to a engineering leader, say here's the problem, um, and they will delegate it to someone else, right? Um, and and that happens on a daily basis, right? That um, I, I I find something, um, hey, you made a purchase here on a credit card. We don't do this. We, we want this purchase going for an invoice and I help them through that process, right? It's, you, you need that understanding, the knowledge and, and the support of leadership. And then, you know, the engineers will follow. Engineers fundamentally want to optimize stuff, right? Um, you need to make cost another dimension that they want to optimize. I like your approach on helping them perform an action. You didn't just go and say you didn't do this action or you need to do this action. You understood why they're not doing this action and then you help them improve that action so that they're ultimately able to do it on their own and understand why and the importance of it. That's the key to success, right? Because you don't know what their knowledge base is, right? You don't know where their skill level is. Uh, I mean, it, sometimes it happens that I come to someone and I start explaining from the basics and they say, Dieter, I already know all of that, right? Tell me, tell me something. What, what, what do I need to do here? What are my alternatives? Right. And that's fine. Right. Then I, then I know, you know, this person is, is already, uh, from the skill set a little bit more knowledgeable and, and, uh, I can work on a different level with them. Dieter, what is some advice you might be able to give an immature or a fa uh, practice as just starting out their FinOps journey? You know, uh, do do something. Don't hesitate, right? I see a lot where where people um, are unsure, right? That maybe they are, um, you know, s still um, early in their career in the FinOps journey, right? And they are unsure about things. Um, but whatever you do, do it in a way where um, you start small, so that you can um, fix something uh, easily rather than, you know, going all in and then, you know, you, you bought like $10 million of RIs and it was the wrong purchase, right? And now you need to figure out how to fix that. But start with something. Um, failing fast need, requires that you do things fast. So I talked to, to someone, uh, I do a lot of uh, uh, outreach as a FinOps ambassador, right? And I talked to someone, they wanted to migrate their data center workload to the cloud and they had a three-year migration plan. I'm like, no, no, don't, don't do that, right? Because there will be failures, right? And you don't want this failure to be in year three, 
right? Do something right away in the next three months and then see if it was successful, adjust, and then take the next bigger challenge, right? Un until you complete it. Don't, um, don't hesitate, you know, um, to, you need to act quickly to be able to fail quickly, right? If you, if you act slowly, then, then your failure will be much later. And, and maybe the only way to course correct is to switch companies at that point. <laughs> I like that advice. Yeah. Well, if I fail enough, I'm out of here. <laughs> well, yeah. say, let's just say that I have a mature FinOps practice. Is there any advice that you're able to give me to help maybe improve some things or stuff that are lessons learned that you went through? Yeah, look at things that you do manually often, right? If let's say if you do forecasts every month, right, and you you are doing it with spreadsheets, yeah, your process is documented, it's repeatable, right? But it's still a manual process. Look at those processes and try to automate them. Um, for example, when when we started with uh, anomaly detection on AWS, uh, we put it into a Slack channel, right? Um, and then we can invite people to that Slack channel so that they can self service those anomalies, right? They can, they can look at what's, what's going on and they will then post replies. Hey, I'm looking at that. I started looking at that, right? Um, we looked at that. We turned off this workload, right? Um, try to use, introduce gradually automation over time, right? Um, reporting will be key because decisions will be made on, on good data and timely data. Um, and what good data is depends on each organization will have a different view, right? When it comes to allocations, to shared costs, how you handle that, right? Um, so there are some very mature uh, FinOps practices like Kim Weir at Target um, has a team of 20 plus people, right? Uh, a lot of them uh, are engineers that work on reports because reports are the, the key to decision-making. So, from from my experience, as you mature, there will be a higher focus on on data within your organization. Good data, mature data, correct data, and the last few people that I've actually talked to for the Faces and FinOps podcast, it's all about accurate reporting and timely data. I think it's all key on performing an action and being able to perform the correct action. That's very right. Um, you know, engineers run experiments. And they want to know the outcome of that experiment, right? An experiment could be, I have an existing workload on an existing technology and I, I introduce one change to it, right? I go maybe from an Intel x86 processor to a um, uh, ARM-based Graviton processor, right? What What uh, is the difference, right? Um, and they, they need this information immediately because when they do such a shift, what happens is that the our eyes are being left stranded on the Intel x86 and being unused. And now they are on a new workload that doesn't have our eyes yet, reserved instances, right? So their cost went up. And they're like, what happened? I thought we would be saving money. Well, you need to tell me that you that you switched instances so that I can adjust the RIs accordingly. Actually, that's some sound advice because not only do you have the Intel, you have the Graviton. There's also AMD processors out there that have the performance base behind that and some cost optimization. You have three different types and you have to make sure that the RIs that you purchase are matching the instances that you're using. And everybody has to be aware of those actions that are happening. And and that's you know uh, also a challenge when it comes to forecasting, right? Because an engineer may build a forecast model for their new workload. It doesn't exist yet, right? It's going to exist in the future, um, but then they forget some line items like data transfer, for example, is a common one, right? Um, so if that model changes, the engineer I I don't know anything about that, right? They started with forty instances. Um, of a certain size. Now they want to go with 20 instances and the forecast model changes, right? They need to communicate those changes. I have, uh, you know, uh, sometimes I hear people complaining about that, that the, the FinOps and the engineers, they need to closely collaborate and finance as well. Dieter, something that I just learned about you during our very first conversation is that you're a contributor to the Cloud FinOps book. Can you tell us about some of your contribution in the book and why? So uh, that is actually a very interesting um, 
because O'Reilly Media approached me and said that J.R. Stormont and, and Mike Fuller are, are writing this book and they need someone to review the book. They have lots of people that review the book on, on grammar and, and syntax and that kind of stuff, but they needed someone to review the book for technical correctness. And they asked me if I could help with that. And so I actually have an O'Reilly Media uh, author profile now as a result, because I, I went through the entire content of the book, right? And um, it was it was a Google Doc and, you know, there was multiple editors. It gets messy pretty quickly. Each editor has like a different color where, where they are contributing with, right? And then I would do comments saying like, hey, you know what? This this graph uh, needs to be improved. Um, it looks like it's a screenshot from taken from somewhere else. Do we have the rights for this graph, right? Um, this this technical statement here. Do we have some data to back that up? Because um, I frankly don't believe it's correct. Um, those kind of comments, right? Um, and it it was a process. It took multiple weeks um, to go over that. And I was working with um, with Mike Fuller um, directly occasionally where we went over some some of these items just to make sure that the, the book has the highest quality. Well, thank you for your contribution into the book and helping out with it. Uh, I'm glad there's another person. And in fact, I've got another cool information for you. So you had some speaking sessions at reInvent in 2016, 2018, 2019, and last year, correct? That's correct. We took a little bit of a break during the pandemic. Well, it just so turns out when I looked up your speaking sessions, I attended the one in 2019, which I think was my second or third reInvent session. Nice. I knew I recognized the name somewhere. And when I looked it up and I looked up the past ones that I attended and the documents and the notes that I took on it, I was actually at one of your sessions. <laughs> That's awesome. Glad I was able to help. <laughs> Uh, it's a small world. And then we're turning around here like a couple of years later and I get to interview you on this awesome podcast. So thank you for putting on those sessions. Uh, do you know if you have any coming here in 2023 or can't you share yet? No, no, I can share. Um, there, were, there might be possibly two sessions. It depends, right? Um, I move quickly. Not everyone does, right? Um, so let, yep. let's see what we can do. I'm planning on definitely uh, uh, attending reInvent. Um, I'm also working with Cloud Academy. They just approached me and said that they want some FinOps courses um, in their portfolio. So um, I do some work there as well. Dieter, how about we switch gears a little bit and have a little bit of fun? And I asked you some off the wall questions. What do you think? Sounds good. <laughs> All right. I didn't. I don't want to prepare you too much for them. But I want to just pick out a couple of questions that help the audience get to know you a little bit more. My first question for you is, what was the last book you read and why? Um, you know, to be really honest, I don't read books. Um, it, you know, like when you look at something like Malcolm Gladwell, uh, Blink, or, or any of his other books, right? Um, the, the core is maybe, you know, a few pages. However, you can't just sell a pamphlet for like $40, right? He, he has to write a 500-page book. Um, but I don't feel like I want to read through this 500-page book to get to the core of his message. So what I do instead is if if the, the author is speaking at the conference, I will watch that video instead, right? Um, and then get within like a 20-minute period um, the, you know, what he's saying there. Like, for example, the, the spaghetti sauce, right? You don't sell more spaghetti sauce by making the world's best spaghetti sauce. You sell more by making all different types of spaghetti sauce with mushrooms, with extra chunky, all that kind of stuff. Right? That's a that's a very good learning, but I don't want to go and spend my time, you know, reading for a 500 page book to get that same learning. Uh, that's very fair. I agree with you. Sometimes uh, it's easier to talk to the author, do a summary or even get the cliff notes for it. Uh, <laughs> I do read a little periodically, but I do like actually listening to some of the stuff while I'm doing it. The audio books are really good. Dieter, my, my next question for you is, where would you be right now if you didn't need to work at all? Um, I, I would be here. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, by now I uh, established a sufficient enough portfolio where I could retire now, right? Um, yep. But I love what I'm doing. I love my, my, my work and I enjoy it. I, I um, derive satisfaction from it. So I, I, you know, if I wouldn't 
have a full-time job, I would probably do more consulting um, on as needed basis, right? Um, and then substitute with with some income from the portfolio. But I, I really enjoy what I'm doing. There is, there is you know, many people, they, they do the job, but because they, they need the income, for me, I do the job because I love it. That's a good uh, perspective to take for things. Uh, exactly why you should do a job is because you love it and the money will come with you. Dieter, my last question is, who are some of the most influential practitioners in FinOps? You know, everyone. Uh, the, the, the FinOps ambassadors, of course, uh, stand out, right? Because they um, they are the ambassadors. They are the ones, the, the spokespeople, right? But I... I learn continuously. Um, I do a lot of outreach. I probably talk to something like 50 uh, different companies a year, right? So about like one a week. Uh, I work with startups, um, you know, in, in other countries as well, Israel, where um, they have a product uh, and they want to use me as a sounding board, right? Um, I do uh, benchmarking sessions where we talk to a, you know, peer organization and we try to find out, you know, where they are in the FinOps journey. We share where we are and we share our mistakes. And we want to learn from, from their mistakes, what, what they did and how they overcame them, right? Um, in this area, you can't just like read a magazine and, and get your knowledge from that, right? I prefer to just talk to people and uh, learn from their learnings. Well, Dieter, I'd like to thank you for joining us for this Faces in FinOps podcast. Thank you so much. Of course. Uh, happy to be here. Everybody, Dieter Mason, who's a senior cloud governance engineer at Roku. Dieter, I really enjoyed our conversation. And this has been another awesome episode and discussion around Faces in FinOps, powered by our good friends at ProsperOps. Be sure to hit that like, subscribe, and notify, and check out our latest episodes on the new YouTube channel and the ProsperOps blog. On until next time.